exploring some places and, and looking at the wildflowers and taking a closer look at some of them. And that's what we'd like to do this evening. Um, take a, taking a taking a closer look at what you're seeing, those asters, those goldenrods, those Joe Pye weeds, and lots of other things as well. So um, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to, first of all, before we even begin, uh, just uh, offer thanks to a few people who have donated, um, generously uh, offered and donated photos for this talk. Some of my friends who are professional photographers, John Tagliaferro, Grace Glynn, Brian Pfeiffer, Kent McFarland, Chris Shorn, and Emily Stone. Um, and the, I haven't been able to use all the photos that everybody gave me, um, but I've, I've used some. And uh, this one, for example, is a beautiful photo by Brian Pfeiffer from Monhegan Island in Maine um, as an introduction. So thank you all. So this is the outline of how we're gonna do this. Uh, the, we're gonna start with just an introduction to how flowers function, how they work, just so we can all get on the same page about, about that. And then we're gonna go on a tour of some different habitats, meadows, roadsides, forests, fens, uh, seeps, and some shores and lake shallows. And then at the very end, we'll offer some um, a little bit of information on other resources and, uh, and we'll have some question and answer and have a little discussion at the end. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, let's see, and what, um, what, what, one of the things I sort of wanted to say is that there's, there are, um, it's not just asters and goldenrods <laughs> and it's not just the meadows. There's lots and lots of things out there. And I just want to encourage you to, um, to get out some, to some different places and look around. It's just so rewarding to, um, to get into some new and new places. Um, so starting, starting with um, how flowers work, I just want to talk about sort of the basics of flower structure. And we'll start with this, this picture of a fringed loose strife, um, which is a beautiful plant that flowers late in the summer. It's mostly past flowering now, but there might be still some, some of this flowering on wood's edges. But to show you, um, this is just to show you the basic parts of a basic flower. This flower has five petals, five yellow petals, and behind those petals are five green sepals, which you can't really see. There are also five stamens, these five things around the edge of, of the interior, and those are the things that carry the pollen. And then in the interior, there is a pistil, which is the part that, um, that houses the ovules, or, uh, which, which are to become the seeds. So this is a really basic flower with, with sepals, petals, stamens, and a pistil in the center, one pistil. Here's another flower that is flowering right now on the roadsides in northern Vermont, fireweed. Um, and this, in this one, you can see the sepals are actually pink, um, and the, there's four of them. And there are four petals, and those are also pink. And there, is, there are stamens on the outside, which in this flower have, have, are starting to wither away. And then there is a pistil in the center. And here is a flower that is in a different stage of development. This is one where the stamens are still, uh, still um, quite in, in good shape and just um, beginning to shed pollen here. So this one is earlier in its development than the previous one. But going back to the previous one, here is a close-up view of that on the pistil, the top part on the pistil is called the stigma or the sticky surface. And that's where this, that's where the pollen lands. And thanks to Grace for this photo. So just to summarize this, here's a diagram of a mature flower um, with, with sepals, petals, stamens, and a pistil. And the pistil contains a stigma, that sticky part, a style, and the ovary, which is where the seeds are. And then the stamen has uh, an anther and a filament, this long skinny thing. Um, and here's a goldenrod flower, which is actually a really quite a different um, setup. Um, so a goldenrod flower has a completely different setup. And, and in a goldenrod flower, um, each of these little things here is a single flower. 
So each of those little units is a flower analogous to the flower that we were looking at before on the fireweed or on the loose stripe. So each, each goldenrod, each, each um, sunflower head, we call it, um, has many, many flowers. And so what we think of as a sunflower flower actually is many flowers. And here's a diagram of that. Um, so there's a receptacle and the, 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 these flowers in the center are called disc flowers and these ones on the outside are called ray flowers. So that's kind of the basics of, of how, um, how the members of the aster family work, the sunflowers and the asters and goldenrods and all their relatives. But within this basic framework, there are three kinds of flowers um, in, the, in the aster family. There are those like this, which is bone set, which has only, does not have any ray flowers. All the flowers are the same. They're all these little tiny flowers. They're all the same. And then there's the chicory type, which has no, none of those little central flowers, but all of the flowers have these big long rays or, or ligules, we call them, which is, which is a tongue. Um, and then, and then going back, then there's the, this type, um, which has, the central flowers and the outer flowers. So there's three types of flowers in the, um, in the aster family, three types of flower heads or arrangements. Um, and then, then we're gonna talk a little bit about reproduction. This is jewelweed or spotted touch me not. And this is a photo showing that right here in this photo, it's hard to read in the photo, but these are stamens and the stamens mature before the pistil, so the male parts mature before the female parts. And here is another, um, this is pale touch me not, which is also showing the stamens in the center. And look, there's an insect in there in this photo. And then um, in this photo, you can see the pistil now is mature. That's the female part in the center of this flower. And that is matured after the, the male part. And so an insect or, um, oh, just, just a pause here. This is why jewelweed is called jewelweed because when, um, when water, when, when there's water on the surface of the leaf, it creates these little jewel-like droplets. Um, but with jewelweed, it can be pollinated by insects or by hummingbirds. And um, this is one of the really coolest things. But when, um, so when, when a hummingbird or a bee goes into that flower, they are looking for a nectar reward. And so this is what goes on with flowers. There is a nectar reward here in the spur of the flower. Whoops, in the spur of this flower, um, there is nectar in there. And I don't recommend doing this, but, but I've done it without any ill effect. And I've actually snipped off with my just bitten off that little spur and it's very sweet because there's nectar in there. <laughs> so um, so that's, that's something that the hummingbird and or the insect that goes into the flower is going after. They're going for that nectar reward. And as they go in for that nectar reward, they're picking up pollen. They're gonna go to another flower and move that pollen to another flower. And that's how it happens. That's how the flowers get pollinated and fertilized. And that's how it works. And so in this case, um, then, then that thing that was in the center of the jewelweed flower ultimately turns into this thing, into this, what we call a capsule or a seed pod. And this capsule, this is the coolest thing. You, many of you know this about jewelweed, which is flowering and fruiting right now, very, very common along roadsides and in sort of wet places. And, um, and one of the things that happens is that this is an explosively open seed pod. So if you just touch it gently, you're gonna, you're gonna cause it to, to open. And I'm gonna show a video right now. If you've got poor internet connection, this may be a little, may not work that well, but, but here we go with this video. I'm gonna show it first in real time and then in slow motion. And here's the slow motion. So you see the seeds popping out of that seed pod just, just by a gentle touch um, by, by my friend Emily. It's 
So there, there's that. That is just a real short primer on flower structure and how flowers reproduce. I want to just stop very, very briefly just to see if there's any questions about that. Yeah, so Liz, one question did come in from Maureen and she was wondering, um, why do so many flowers have odd numbers of petals, like five or seven? Well, um, that that is, there, there are some with four also, and there are some with two. So there are some with even numbers and some with odd numbers. And I don't have a good answer to that question, why there are more with, with odd numbers, like five. Five is a very common, common number, um, but it varies with plant families. So members, for example, of the, what I showed you, the fireweed, that's a member of the family that is the evening primrose family that always has two or four petals. Um, so it has to do with how the, how the flowers evolved over time, but I don't, don't have a great answer to that question. It's a really good one, Maureen, thank you. Don't know. Great, and just one more question it seems from Jenny. Um, do sepals serve a specific purpose for the flower? Do sepals, yes. So sepals are usually green and they do, they protect the flower. They wrap around the flower and protect the flower as it is opening. So often, you know, in, 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 if it's opening, for example, in the spring, it protects it from the cold, protects it from the elements, protects those delicate petals from, from damage and protects the stamens and, and all those delicate parts in the center. That's what it does. That's what this, this, the uh, sepals do. Great. And then Liz, time for one more or yeah. should we? Okay, great. So Jenny is wondering, why are the first flowers in the spring and the last in the fall often purple, white, and yellow? Good question, Jenny. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, but we do have a variety, a, a big variety of flower colors right now, even in this photo that you're looking at. Um, pink, purple, yellow, uh, white, orange, um, and blue. So, so um, there's, a, there's a great variety, but um, yeah, another great question. I don't have an answer to that one, Jenny, thanks. Okay, somebody asked me something I know. Yeah, <laughs> plenty, plenty, Liz. Um, I think that's all we've got now for questions. So we'll let you continue on. And just a reminder, folks, if, you know, as your questions come up, just enter them in the Q&A and then Liz will be able to um, take a bunch of those questions at the end. Great. Okay, good. Thanks. And then, so we're going to have a little tour now of, of some habitats, some different habitats, starting with meadows. And these are the places where we're seeing our asters and our goldenrods right now and our joe pie weeds. So let's just take a tour of, of some meadows and some of the flowers that occur there. Um, here is a meadow view. Um, this is a wet meadow in um, Ethan Allen Homestead in Burlington, where you can see some goldenrods and Joe pieweed, uh, and and actually some jewelweed in the foreground, and this thing that's that you can sort of barely make out. We'll talk about that in in a, in a minute. And here is New England aster, which is I don't know. I I gotta say it's it's one of my favorites. I just love New England aster, and I picked some, which is behind me here. Um, I actually grow it in my garden. I, I sent out a note to some friends recently with a photo of New England aster and, um, and a, a close-up photo. And I said, posed the question, who doesn't love New England aster? Well, one of my friends answered, actually, she said, I can tell you who does not like New England aster. My gardening clients don't like it. They want me to pull it out because it comes up in the garden. Well, I planted these flowers that are behind me. I planted them in my garden in, on purpose. I love New England aster. And I'll tell you a little story. Yesterday afternoon, I went out to take some more photos and I went to a park near me, Mills Riverside Park in Jericho. And I will tell you, the monarch butterflies were just going crazy. There were just so many of them all over the New England asters. And um, just, they were just, and they didn't, I, they didn't care that I was there. I was just, I got pretty close to them and I just took, took millions of photos. And it's just a spectacular thing in the afternoon to, to witness all these monarchs uh, feeding on, feeding on the nectar. Um, 
in the in the uh, in the uh, New England aster, very important food source for them. Some of the other asters that occur in our meadows. This one is swamp aster, um, and I'm purposely showing you, you know, both a, a, an intact and you know nice flower, and also one that is um, that's sort of gone by, and you can see the fruits there. You can see these little these little uh, hairy things. Those are those are the um, bristles that are going to carry the seeds on the wind, just like dandelion seeds. Many, many of our asters are dispersed that way with, with um, dandelion-like plumes on their seeds. This is a close-up of the swamp aster, and this is its stem, which is a very, um, very hairy stem. Very, um, and this is one of the commonest asters in moist places. Another common aster is heart-leaved aster, and there's a, a bee visiting the heart-leaved aster. And then um, flat-topped aster is another very, very common species that is abundant right now in the meadows. Uh, it, and it, it doesn't always have a super flat top. It's often more sort of a sort of a rounded dome umbrella shape. Um, but it's very recognizable right now. When you see some vast areas of white in the meadows right now, that's what it is. It is this flat-topped aster. Um, the bone, bone, sweat, bone set is also white, but it is mostly um, past flower now. And there's a closer look at the um, flat-topped aster. And look, there you see the aster flower is set up just like the sunflower. Uh, the aster flower head, rather, is set up just like the sunflower head with these little uh, tiny flowers in the center. And there's, a, there's stamens and the ray flowers on the outside, which are showy and which are the ones that, that attract the insect. So to an insect, this whole thing looks like a flower and they are drawn to the center of it. Those outer flowers, those ray flowers, usually actually are sterile and do not actually function um, to produce seed, but, um, but rather just to attract insects. Panicled aster is another very, very common aster out there right now. It has little tiny white, um, white flower heads. Another one with even tinier flower heads um, is this one that's behind me, which is, and I'll just show you here, which is calico aster. So the two common ones that have tiny, tiny white flower heads are this panicle, panicled aster and calico aster. Now, goldenrods, there's many, many kinds of goldenrods in Vermont and uh, dozens. And this is one, again, one of the most common ones. It's called rough stemmed goldenrod. I love how it just, it has this sort of pagoda shape to it. It doesn't, it's not always shaped like that, um, but, but it often is. And here's another way that it can look. You see, it's be beginning to have that pagoda shape, but a sort of ladder-like arrangement of the leaves. And those are very distinctive leaves with teeth along their margins. And its stem is also very rough. Um, it also grows in moist places. So just like the rough stemmed or the swamp aster has a very rough, hairy stem. And there's a close up of the flowers. Again, you know, you can see that this is, this is like a mini sunflower with the little tiny disc flowers in the center and the ray flowers on the outside, but everything is just tinier on a goldenrod and, um, and they're all yellow. Um, and now here's something interesting on, on a goldenrod, a Canada goldenrod, um, which does not have a rough stem or, or, or toothed leaves, as you can see, you can see everything's different on this one. But look at this, this is a gall that is made with a midge, made by a midge um, uh, um, laying its egg in here, which changes the growth pattern of the goldenrod. Now, there are dozens, there are dozens of, of insects that make goldenrods their home and that cause galls on goldenrod. Um, so it's a very, there's, there's many, many species. And many of you are familiar with the one that's sort of like a little golf, golf ball on the goldenrod stem. That's probably the most commonly encountered one, um, but, but a very common thing in goldenrods. Now, goldenrods, can, they're not all sort of that, that fan-shaped um, arrangement of flowers like you saw in the rough-stemmed goldenrod. That is a common way that the inflorescences or the flower heads are arranged, but they can also be arranged in a, in a tall, narrow arrangement like this in this downy goldenrod, which looking closer, there it is again. 
And they can also be, now here's a question for you. When is a goldenrod not a goldenrod? Well, when it's a silver rod, <laughs> silver rod is a golden rod. And if you look closely at this plant, you'll see, look, there's an ant on it. It's arranged just like a golden rod and it is a golden rod, only the flowers are white instead of yellow. So this is called silver rod, which is a fun one to find and not so, not so common. And then there's another way that the flowers are in inflorescences flower heads can be arranged and that is sort of in a flat topped cluster at the top of the plant and that is um, what goes on with this grass leaved goldenrod. Okay now Joe Pieweed. Joe Pieweed is one of the you know the most conspicuous and abundant and beautiful meadow flowers right now um, and you just you can't not love Joe Pieweed. <laughs> And if you look closely at the Joe Pie weed, again, you'll see that it does not have the arrangement like the sunflower arrangement, but um, like the bone set, all of the flowers are the little tiny ones um, in the center that there are no ray flowers, just the tiny center ones or disc flowers. There's a bunch of different insects that, that use um, Joe Pieweed, Smith's Dart, thanks to Kent McFarland for this, Tricolored Bumblebee, Signet Quaker Moth, and Monarch, of course. Um, um, and also um, the Common Ringlet, thanks to Brian Pfeiffer for this, this beautiful image. Um, so lots of different insects use Joe Pieweed. Okay, moving on to some other things that are not members of the aster family. We've got tear thumb, which is a member of the buckwheat family. This is a family that's also conspicuous at this time of, of the year. Looking more closely at the tear thumb, you'll see that it has um, a, a flower with five things that are the, both sepals and petals, and they all look the same, so they're not differentiated strongly. Um, but there are five of them with um, with some stamens in the center. Uh, and if you look at the stem of this tear thumb, you'll see that it is, it's got these very sharp barbs. Another thing you'll see on the, in this photo is that a, at, the stem, at the node where the leaf is attached, there is this collar, and that is characteristic of the buckwheat family. Many members of this, all members of the family have that but the uh, barbs are really characteristic. And that is an adaptation for dispersal. So if you walk through a patch of tear thumb, it won't just tear your thumb, it'll tear your legs and it'll attach to your legs and it'll go with you. And the whole inflorescence or flower head and all the seeds will go with you and will be dispersed to a new location. Now in another um, member of this family, we have this one called jump seed which is also common in wet places, especially floodplains. And how this one works is actually it's stigmas, the, the, the parts that um, are the part that catch the pollen actually stay on the seed for, it, for um, while at, at, past its maturity and they get sticky. And this, the, this for these, um, the whole thing will fall off if you touch it, but also this will stick to you by those, um, by those stigmas. Okay, some other families now in wet meadows. This is burr cucumber, uh, which is growing. You have seen this all over the place. This just crawls all over everything. It's beautiful white spray of flowers. Some of my neighbors a couple of years ago wrote on, to, on our front porch forum and asked, is this a weed? How do I get rid of it? I hate this thing. It's crawling all over this and that. And, <laughs> and you know, a weed is just a plant that is growing where you don't want it but um, this one is uh, common, commonly crawling all over things, including on this um, staghorn sumac. And here it is crawling around with, uh, with uh, jewel weed and there are its leaves and there are its pods, its fruits, which are really cool. And there's a close up of the flower. And there's the flower, um, there's the flower um, withering as the pod develops. Those pods, by the way, are related to the loofah sponge. Um, and inside those pods are this, this, this network um, that is just like a loofah. Another related plant, these are in the squash family, is star cucumber, which has a flower that looks like this. And this is really cool because these are actually stamens 
that are tightly, um, tightly balled up in the flower. Really fascinating arrangement. And there's its fruit. That's why they call it star cucumber. Another thing that crawls all over everything is virgin spower. And here's a close look at the virgin spower. And another look with another insect. There's some actually some terathum mixed up with the virgin spower. And there's the fruit of the virgin spower. Again, it's a thing that flies on the wind and disperses that way. Now, going back to the buckwheat family, we have this thing called climbing buckwheat, which is another one that climbs all over things, just like the burr cucumber and just like the virgin spower. Um, and it's, you know, it's again, it's one that you might look at it and say, gosh, is that a, a weed? Is that a non-native plant? But no, it's a native plant. Um, and it's a beautiful thing that if we look more closely at it. Again, it's a member of the, as I said, a member of the buckwheat family. And there are its fruits, which are these beautiful winged things. And there it is climbing on Joe Pieweed um, in a wet meadow. This was in Ethan Allen Homestead in Burlington. Okay, now we're going to take a little pause and just go to roadsides, because this is where we see a lot of things. And um, so the meadows are the places where we, we think of when we think of fall wildflowers, asters and goldenrods and so forth. But there's stuff growing right along the roadsides. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. A couple of them are not native. A couple of them are native. Um, this is, is a really common thing called mugwort. And this is a roadside in Jericho where I live. This is a plant that actually obscures my view as I'm, <laughs> there's a certain intersection in, in Richmond um, that, that you know, whenever I get to that intersection, I think, oh, I wish they'd cut down the mugwort because it, it, it obscures my view of oncoming traffic. But if you look closer at it, it's actually a really cool looking thing. Um, it, this, by the way, is not a native plant. And um, I have marked non-native plants in these uh, names with an asterisk. So that's how you can tell. Um, but in our air, but if you look at this flower, this inflorescence, this flower head closely, it is of the type that does not have ray flowers. It's in the aster family, uh, again, but it, it only has the little tiny disc flowers, not the ray flowers. Um, but it's actually quite pretty when you look at it closely. These are the, um, the stigmas of the female part, and these are stamens. Now, another one that we plant that we love to hate is ragweed, another non-native plant. And looking more closely at it, again, this is a member of the aster family and has these funny little, little flower heads that, again, just have the, the um, disc flowers, no ray flowers. And why this isn't, this is an allergen. It, it does cause allergies um, and goldenrod does not. Goldenrod is often implicated with, uh, for hay fe fever at this time of year because it flowers at the same time as ragweed and ragweed is quite inconspicuous. This is a very close photo. It's, it's really an ins inconspicuous plant. It's just this sort of, it's green and pe many people don't notice it, but the pollen of uh, ragweed looks like this, and that's why it bothers your nasal passages. Don't tell me it looks like you know what, <laughs> kind of does. Um, another thing on our roadsides is chicory, which I mentioned before. It's a non-native plant and, um, and it's a beautiful plant and I love it. Uh, it. Again, it's not native, but it's not invasive either. It's just a, just a beautiful, beautiful thing when you look at it closely. Another one that's not native is Queen Anne's Lace. Also gracing our roadsides now, again, not native, but not invasive. Queen Anne's Lace has this amazing thing of this flower um, it, right in the center. This is in the parsley family, and it is also called wild carrot, but this amazing dark purple flower. And this photo was taken by John Tagliaferro. I forgot to put his name on this slide, so I want to acknowledge him for this gorgeous photo um, of this central central colored um, part of the Queen Anne's lace, which is meant to draw insects in. Another roadside plant that's na a native plant uh, is evening primrose, which is a really cool plant that has a, just a beautiful flower. It's called evening primrose because it flowers, it op the flowers open at night and uh, close during, during the sunny part of the day. Um, and there is a moth called the primrose moth that specializes on the evening primrose. And sometimes if the moth, the moth can actually get caught in there if it visits the plant at, at night and stays there and the plant 
then the flowers close up, the moth can actually get sort of stuck there. Um, another beautiful native plant that grows on roadsides, uh, to, uh, this is sort of a northern plant, is pearly everlasting. And here's a close up of it. Um, this is Anaphilus margaritacea, is the name of, of the plant. And I didn't know this until very recently when my sister Margaret told me this that Margaret, the name Margaret means pearl. So if you are named Margaret, your name means pearl. And this is a gorgeous, gorgeous plant, um, which makes it beautiful, dries really well. That's why they call it everlasting. Okay, now we're gonna move uh, away from the roadsides and into the woods, into the forests, um, because you'll find wildflowers there too. And so here's one, here's a patch of forest in um, Moncton. And uh, this is a, a, a public land hogback community forest in Moncton where I hiked the other day, where we found white wood aster. And you can see it's just covering the forest floor. There's just tons of it. And also world wood aster, which is also just covering the forest floor in places. Two very common uh, asters that are in the woods. And there's a closer look at the world wood aster. Again, the ray flowers, and the disc flowers. And some goldenrods in the woods. This is blue stemmed goldenrod. And this one is zigzag goldenrod because the stem sort of zigs and zags a little bit. These pictures were taken at Niquette Bay State Park in Colchester. And here's something called tall rattlesnake root. You've probably seen this, but isn't this the coolest thing? These are, um, these are, in the aster family too, and they have um, only only ligulate flowers. They're like the chicory setup, um, but each of those flowers is fertile. And there is these are stamens surrounding the pistil, so you can see the the stigmas sticking out of a collar of stamens there. And the pistil, the stigmas, the sticky part of the pistil have pollen all over them. So it's sticky, the pollen has stuck to the, um, to the stigma and, and so those flowers have become fertilized. Another one in the woods, also a member of the aster family and related to Joe Pieweed and Boneset, this is white snake root, Adratina altissima, beautiful thing in the woods. This is actually poisonous to livestock. And here's one in the woods that is not flowering yet, but I love this. This is something for you to look forward to. I love this photo. This is a gorgeous photo by Brian Pfeiffer. Thank you, Brian. And um, one of my favorite things, this is flowering. This will be flowering in October. So keep your eyes out for this. This is witch hazel, common witch hazel, a shrub in the woods, in all kinds of woods. So keep your eye out for that. And here's one um, to the question of, of why some flowers have four, some have five. This one happens to have four parts. Um, four sepals, these are the sepals. These are the strap-like petals on which hazel, four stamens and a single pistil. Okay, now we're gonna go to some wetlands, some fens. Well, we're gonna to go to one fen in particular, which is Chickering Fen in Calais, um, owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. I am grateful to the Nature Conservancy for this um, incredible place. Uh, love it. And uh, here's another view of it with the central pond. One of the plants that's common here um, is another kind of goldenrod, one of the spiky kind of goldenrods called um, called bog goldenrod. And here is bog, bog goldenrod. And this is growing in actually in a wet meadow uh, on the edge of, of chickering bog. And there's some other goldenrods here, but um, and some Joe Pye, but there's the bog goldenrod there. And there's another look at the bog goldenrod. Another thing flowering at this time of the year, not in the aster family, but a completely different family is horned bladderwort, Utricularia cornuta. This is an amazing little plant that is flowering right now in Chickering Fen, in the wet parts of Chickering Fen. Here's another thing that's flowering there now. Somebody mentioned cardinal flower, which I don't have a photo of, but this is related to cardinal flower. This is another lobelia. This is Calm's lobelia, and I'll tell you this flower is only about mm, a third of an inch long. It's a tiny, tiny little thing. 
um, but this is a close up of it. Small green wood orchid is flowering there now. And tawny cotton grass, beautiful cotton grass is flowering in Chickering Bog right now. So those just a few things that are flowering in the, in the fen, I will call it. Um, I could call it Chickering Bog, but fen is a kind of peatland that is fed by calcareous groundwater. So it's not quite the same as a bog, but there are a lot of species in common. Well, now we're going to look at some seeps. A seep is a place where groundwater is emerging at the surface. Um, and you, uh, you find seeps in the woods, but, and you find seeps in open places. You find seeps on roadsides, um, and you find seeps on river shores. So a seep is a place where groundwater is emerging at the surface and therefore it is wet. Um, th there are all kinds of seeps. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of different ones. One is the first seep that I visited recently is just on a roadside in Danville. It's right along Route 2 in Danville, but some of the same vegetation I'm told is found along the, um, the rail trail near there in West Danville. And this is the seat, this is a terrible photograph, but you can sort of get a sense of this sort of jumble of vegetation of northern white cedar and larch. And here in the center of the photo is, uh, is this plant, which is a um, lady's tresses, uh, nodding lady's tresses, Spiranthes cernua, which is an orchid, which is flowering right now in these seeps. Um, just a beautiful thing. And again, some of my colleagues sent me photos of this um, also, uh, but this is, you know, um, really a, a wonderful um, plant. And again, you know, you can see, you can see the adaptation to inviting insects in. There's a little yellow part in the center of this flower and um, an insect will be invited into this and for a nectar reward and, um, and pollinate the flowers that way. Another thing that's flowering, that's past flowering um, there at that seed, but it's dispersing its seeds right now, and that's alpine bulrush. Now here's another kind of seed. This is a riverside seed. Um, this is a calcareous riverside seed on the White River in Sharon and Pomfret, again owned and managed, managed by the Nature Conservancy. And I'm grateful for this site too. It's, it's just an amazing place. Um, it's really some place you have to really kind of tube to rather than um, hike to. It's, it's, it's hard to get to. The first time I discovered this place actually was a friend of mine and I were, <clears throat> were driving around botanizing and we were driving along Route 14 over here across the river and looked across and said, hey, that looks interesting. So we donned our bathing suits and swam across, <laughs> found this really cool place with a lot, of <clears throat> a lot of really cool plants. This was many years ago. And... Um, among them, we found eyebright, this beautiful plant called eyebright, lots of it there in this seep. And um, this photo, which is an amazing photo by my friend Chris Shorn, um, is maybe a different species of eyebright, but it, it shows you, it's very similar, and it shows you, um, again, you know, the adaptation to pollination with this big yellow spot it's, it's a nectar guide, basically, a big yellow spot and these stripes on the flower guiding an insect into there to, to collect pollen and then deposit it on this stigma, which is the, the female part. So collecting pollen and then depositing it there on the stigma. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. And there's tons of it there at that seed. So I want to thank Chris for this beautiful photo. This is actually from Maine. Another thing at that seep is again the Calms lobelia and little green sedge, um, which is uh, one of my favorite sedges. And um, this thing called the slender gerardia, uh, which is a beautiful thing growing on that, that shore. And then obedience, um, physostegia, which is a plant that again, um, you know, really has a great like a landing pad for insects to, in these spots that attract the insects to go in. But this is actually a rare plant that grows on, um, on river shores. 
Another one that's growing in that seed is fen grass of Parnassus. Um, I call it grass of Parnassus. Many of my friends call it fen grass of Parnassus. And this is a photo by Kent McFarland. And here it is growing with the calm slobelia. And here's a photo by Brian Pfeiffer of the same, same thing. Uh, beautiful, beautiful photo by Brian. He, he, um, if you're interest, more interested in this, you should visit his blog where he talks about this and, all, and the adaptations um, in, in this flower. It's an amazing thing. With these, these uh, yellow things, these yellow blobs are nectaries. They are nectar producing blobs. And there are, it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six. It looks like there's a bunch of them, but you'll see they're united at the bottom. So there's one unit for each of the five petals. So there's five units, just like there are five stamens and five petals in a single pistil. And there is an amazing uh, symbiosis. There is a bee that is named for this plant, for Parnassia. Um, it is called the, um, the and Parnassia uh, andrina bee, and it is especially as is directly associated with this plant um, in an amazing um, uh, symbiosis and, uh, and a very rare bee at that. Um, here's another really cool plant. This, this is actually my friend Grace sent me these photos last night, and I said, geez, I got to use these photos. So beautiful. Thank you, Grace. This is um, fringed gentian, which grows in seeps. And this is the fringed gentian as it is at, before it's opening, when it's in bud and, and covered with droplets of water. Just gorgeous. And here it is as it opens in this wet meadow that Grace was visiting. And here it is, um, as you look at it, um, head, looking head down after the flowers opened somewhat and um, just an amazing plant, not a common plant. So those are some plants of seeps. I'm gonna now finally move to some shores. Um, this is a shore of a beaver pond actually in Bolton at the Preston Pond Natural Area, where commonly grows this plant, closed gentian or bottle gentian. Uh, and this is an, a beautiful plant that is flowering at this time of year. And I know many of you have been probably seeing this. Um, it's, it's not a super common thing, but it's also not rare. Um, when I was there visiting Preston Pond a few days ago, um, I saw this bee trying to get into, um, into the gentian flower. And, uh, and it did. It, it just, it, you know, soon enough, th this is the same be in the same flower. Soon enough, it was actually right, and I didn't get a photo of this, but it was right down in there. It, it pries open the flower and goes right down in after um, the nectar and, and gathers up the pollen and then moves on to another. I think you can actually even see some pollen stuck to, to this bumblebee's uh, leg uh, and then moves on to another flower. So they, they look to be closed. They look to be impossible to get into. You can be a strong insect to get, to get in and out of that thing, um, but this one did it easily. And here finally is a lake shore in Burlington. Uh, actually, this is in Colchester. This is Delta Park in Colchester. You, you know, the, the, the fact that the mouth of the Winooski River is so wild is just an astounding thing to me and a wonderful thing. And I have to thank uh, for that the Winooski Valley Park District in large part, um, partly the city of Burlington, partly the Nature Conservancy, um, but a lot of it is the Winooski Valley Park District keeping these lands, oh, sorry, and the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, um, which manages some of this land at the mouth of the Winooski River. So just an amazing thing, beautiful wildlands um, there right at the mouth of the Winooski River, just in Burlington and Colchester. Um, and there, um, when I was visiting the other day, I saw all kinds of cool things, but including them were this pickerel weed, um, nodding burr marigold, which is again, um, you know, it's got the sunflower type arrangement, a member of the aster family, um, common arrowhead. And this is actually a male, this is a plant that has separate male and female flowers. And this is a male, these are stamens on a male flower and here's a female flower, um, thanks to Emily, uh, really different kind of look to it. You see two different kinds of looks and these will, this will develop into a, into a ball of fruits. Um, hedge nettle grows there on that shore, beautiful. This is flowering right now. These are things that are flowering right now. 
Um, this is in the mint family. Look at that cool, um, that insect. Um, I think I think John told me that this is called a thick-headed fly. <laughs> this thing that's, that's approaching that flower. Here's another thing that's flowering right now. And this is in the mint family. In this case, you can see the one of the characteristics of the mint family, which is a very square stem. And this one is called, um, is called skull cap um, because of this little cap-like thing at the base of the flower. Um, water smartweed is another thing that's flowering there right now, another member of the buckwheat family. And there it is with a closer, slightly closer look and you can see the stamens coming out. And uh, here we have monkey flower. Um, Mimulus ringens, um, another plant that has great adaptation for insects visiting this color guide and a sort of landing pad. And here it is with an insect visiting, thanks to John and Emily for those photos. And I think this might be the final one. Um, here's the pickerel weed again, a beautiful photo of pickerel weed with a, with a dragonfly visiting it. And, um, it, it grows in shallow water, um, but you can get really quite close to it at this time of year um, with the water lake level down a little bit. And there is a, a close look at the pickerel weed. And, and again, a closer look and look at that, a yellow guide, a nectar guide telling the insect, this is where to come. This is the center of the flower. That is, that is, um, uh, my tour, that's the tour. And so I wanna move on now to just um, to wrap up with some resources and time for some questions. A um, couple things, one is the Vermont Atlas of Life, which is, which is um, a part of um, um, Sorry, yeah, so, so I'm just a Vermont Atlas of Life. And here, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies manages this Vermont Atlas of Life. Um, and then a couple of books, Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is my favorite. Um, it's very old, but it's still my favorite. Uh, uh, Wildflowers of New England is a great resource. Um, so I'm gonna pause now for a few questions, see if there are some, any questions. Great, thanks Liz for that really magnif magnificent tour. Um, some great pictures and then some neat tips on where to go to see all these cool plants. Um, so a number of uh, questions came in. The first one is Jennifer. Uh, you, you kind of, I think, piqued her curiosity and Jennifer's wondering, can you eat jewelweed? Can you eat jewelweed? Yeah. Yes, um, <laughs> as I said, you know, don't try this at home, but um, but it's there's nothing poisonous about jewelweed, and and actually the leaves are very are edible and and delicate. Another use of jewelweed that many people <clears throat> have talked about is that it's got a very milky. It's an annual plant. Um, it's one of the few annuals in our flora, um, and and it has a very um, juicy stem. You can take that stem, the liquid from that stem, and rub it on a, a nettle sting, and it'll relieve the stinging. Of of the nettle, those two plants often grow together, so it's a sort of handy thing. Um, but yeah, you can you can eat it. It's not listed anywhere I know of as a you know a primary edible plant. But yes, but yes, you can. Great, thanks, Liz. And I see a quick question in the chat. Do you mind going back to the slide before? I think folks want to write down those two books that you had um, okay. yeah. done, and we'll do that. And so while you're doing that, um, Nicole is wondering, right, there we go, thanks. There you go, everyone, if you wanna write down those books. Um, yeah, and before you go forward, um, I was just yeah. having a little bit of a memory thing um, that iNaturalist, the Vermont Atlas of Life that I talked about is part of iNaturalist, which is a which is an amazing resource, an amazing um, website and, and phone app um, for identifying uh, organisms, plants, animals, insects, lots of things, and also reporting your finds. Um, and so it's a really, really amazing resource. There are other um, resources for identifying plants, but I, I really do recommend that. And also um, a thing called SEEK, S-E-E-K, which is part of iNaturalist. 
So those are great resources as well. Great, thanks Liz. Um, excellent, so Nicole's wondering, do wildflowers grow everywhere? Or are they particular to regions? Uh, Nicole's new to Vermont and she's never seen so many wild tulips in spring or daylilies in summer. Mm, mm, yeah, um, wildflowers do grow everywhere. Yeah, they do grow everywhere um, throughout throughout um, the world. And in the, as far as you know, there's there's sort of two parts to that question. One is, um, how, like biomass, <laughs> where do you see the most wildflowers? And this photo that you have right before you now is is a, a meadow of wild, what we, you know, we would call a wildflower meadow with asters and goldenrods and joe pie weed in the foreground. Um, and there's just an abundance of wildflowers there in the fall of the year. Um, but the number of species is not that great. Um, if you go into the woods, then there's just as many species, but they're much more sparsely distributed. So you might, you might only see a wildflower here and there. Um, so it kind of depends on what kind of habitat you're in, but every kind of habitat has wildflowers. And if you want to broaden your view of what a uh, wildflower even is, you know, you could include things like grasses and sedges and rushes, um, like that cotton grass, those two cotton grasses that I showed. Those are wildflowers too, but they don't have showy, colorful flowers. Um, so yeah, wildflowers are everywhere. And, and Vermont does have an abundance of, of wildflowers. Great. Thanks, Liz. Um, so happy, happy botanizing, Nicole. Um, so Liz, Carrie's wondering why might uh, have sumac on one side of, of my woods gone to flower while sumac on the other side hasn't? Yeah, so sumac is a really interesting plant. That's great. Um, <clears throat> sumac, as I mentioned, some plants have separate male and female plants, separate male and female flowers, sometimes separate male and female flowers on the same plant, sometimes separate male and female flowers on different plants. Sumac is of that type. There are male plants and there are female plants. <clears throat> there is also, it is also a clonal plant, which means that one group of plants, a big, huge group, it could be 20, 40, 100 feet wide group of sumac plants <clears throat> will be all, all of really genetically one plant and those will all be male or all be female. Um, when they're young, they don't flower at all. So that might be what's going on. But then um, the male ones will flower uh, when the male flowers appear in earlier in the summer, they once they've done their work of shedding pollen, they disappear and you don't see flowers on the male plants anymore. What you do see now is on the female plants or the female clones, you see those red cones, as I showed you, um, that had the burr cucumber kind of crawling all over them. That is the fruit. Those are the fruits. Um, so those are the female plants with their mature fruits. And so you might have a whole group, a whole clone, a whole batch of plants that doesn't appear to be doing anything. Maybe it already flowered, maybe it's too young to have done so. Great, excellent, thanks Liz. Um, and Michael is wondering, well, the ant made, made me ask, do flowers other than mi milkweed have pollinia too? Yes, so pollinia are, are um, <clears throat> Uh, cl clusters of pollen, if you will, if I just want to, I just want to simplify a little bit, but yeah, pollen that is, that is found in, in um, clusters, and yes, other plants have that as well. Thank you. Um, and Vicki, Vicki shared, Terathum is so miserable. However, I've seen a plant that looks like it, but doesn't scratch. You know, what, what could that be? Okay, yeah, so right, so there are, um, many, many members of that buck, it's in the buckwheat family. And I showed just a few members of the buckwheat family, but there are dozens of members of that family in Vermont. Um, some of them are, are weeds, some of them are not native, some of them are cultivated, some of them are native weeds. Um, there's all kinds of members of that family that look like tear thumb, but they, the ones that that are not tear thumb typically have more elongate or longer and narrower um, groups of flowers like the 
water smart weed that I showed. If you're in the Burlington area by any chance, I didn't show this picture, but if you're in the Burlington area and you want to go to see an, an, a, um, a cultivated member of the family, a cultivated smart weed, go to the uh, to city market downtown in Burlington, the co-op in, in downtown Burlington. They've got these gorgeous six, eight foot tall <clears throat> members of the genus, uh, of that genus Persicaria, the smart weeds. It's this bright pink, beautiful smart weed that they've got planted in the gardens there. So yeah, there's a lot of members of that group that don't have those spines. Great, thanks Liz. Um, Linda's wondering why are so many common prolific plants not considered native? What's, what's the difference? Maybe if you could talk about native versus non-native. Yeah. yeah, so Vermont has about 2,000 <clears throat> plants, uh, vascular plants, not counting mosses, fungi, etc. About 2,000 vascular plants and about fully one quarter of them are not native. And a very small number of those are considered invasive. Those are ones that invade our natural habitats, things like Japanese knotweed, purple loose strife, things like that. Um, and I, uh, uh, but the rest of them are, are what we might call benign non-natives. And what we mean by not native is that it was, we think it was not in, on this continent um, before about 400 years ago. That was a time when things vastly changed on this continent um, through European settlement. And um, there were, of course, people here, people here long before that, but the Europeans brought brought some plants with them. And, uh, and so the flora changed quite a bit at that time. Ragweed is one of those. In fact, scientists use ragweed as a mark of when uh, an area was settled by, settled by white people. So, um, so that's what we mean by not native. It means that it was that it, it's uh, native um, evolved in Europe or Asia usually, sometimes other parts of the world, but most of them are from Europe or Asia, um, but did not evolve on this continent. So this, this, um, this Caitlin, maybe this is a good segue to the next slide, um, which is just, um, I don't mention them specifically, but um, there are some upcoming events. I don't know if you want to, do you want to talk about, since we're talking about non-native invasive species, do you want to talk about upcoming events? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we can go back to the q and I guess, once we make this quick announcement, Liz. Okay, sure. great. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I'll just uh, mention that for anyone who's up near Newport in the Northeast Kingdom, there's an event tomorrow night. Um, at the Vermont Land Trust Bluffside Farm, which is going to go over invasive plant control. It's um, from 5.30 to 7, and you can register by going to our website, which is there on the slide, vlt.org events. Um, we also have our annual meeting. There are um, some tours that are happening around the state, three different tours on three different properties, including our Brewster Uplands Conservation Trust property in Jeffersonville, and then um, down in Brattleboro, Wentastaguck, which is the um, the El New Abenakis um, connection. There'll be some storytelling there and, and history of that. So uh, the old forest one, unfortunately, has already filled. So I <laughs> will we'll have to catch you, catch the next one that Liz does there. Um, and so those are some upcoming events. As, as I mentioned, I'll also you know, say you'll be getting a, a follow-up email with some resources and including Liz are the two books that you mentioned in that follow-up list of resources. And there are also, I will also yeah. want to mention um, two other webinars that we have done in the past that might answer some questions. One was last year about this time that I did together with Kent McFarland. It was called Meadows of Bloom and it had a lot more information, really wonderful stuff from Kent about insect relationships to, the, to, to many of these plants. It's just Kent, Kent's understanding of these, the insect uh, plant, plant interactions is, is just fascinating. So go back to our YouTube channel and look for that webinar called Meadows Abloom. And then um, the other one that we did earlier this summer is called Gardening with Wildflowers, which will answer some of your questions about how to use some of these plants um, in your own gardens. So those are some resources and those will come to you in an email following following this, right? And then Caitlin, um, 
I just love that vlt.org slash events is that like all you got to remember. Just go there, keep going back there, and there's going to be great stuff coming up um, in, in the future. So remember that email, that, great. that, that URL. Great. Excellent. Emails, uh, mine is liz at vlt.org. Just write me anytime. With That's that. great. Okay. And I'll I'm put that. Stay. Great. And I'm happy to stay um, for more questions. Great. Okay. I just put Liz's email in the um, in the chat along with the link to. Um, let's see. Oh no, I didn't do it to everyone. Sorry about that. I will put Liz's to email. Liz's email in the chat, um, and there you go. I'll also put our YouTube um, link in the chat. Uh, but back to questions. Um, so let's see. Liz, we have a question from Kathleen. She's wondering, how quickly do flowers replenish their nectar? I sometimes see hummers, bees, moths, butterflies going to the same flowers multiple times each day. Are they getting anything? This is, I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, my understanding has been that it's a, sort of a one-time production of nectar, but I really don't know the answer to that question. That's a great one, Kathleen. I'm going to write it down and uh, do a little research on that. So do send me a note and I'll, I'll, if I found out, I'll let you know. Great, excellent. And Kathleen Liz's email is in the chat so you can email her with that. Um, let's see, Helen's wondering, do you know of a good key for golden rods? Yeah, uh, I do really like, um, I do really like the Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. Um, it's really simple and it's, it's, uh, it's, just um, a, a really great resource. I think it's probably the best book for goldenrods. Um, some of the names in that book are out of date because the book was published in 1977, um, but the goldenrods are still goldenrods. And uh, so those names are not out of date. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great resource. Another resource which <clears throat> Which I, um, which if you get into more rare species or more technical things, which is in in the um, which is uh, Go Botany. It's a it's a website, and it's in that. I can just go back a couple slides um, at the bottom of this here, um, and you can just Google Go Botany uh, Native Plant Trust or just plain Go Botany, and. Um, that's a great place that's, that has online interactive keys um, to all, all of the floor of New England. So that's a really great resource as well. Perhaps a bit more technical. And so you'll need to be, you know, sort of looking closely at, at things. Um, but those are two great resources. And the Go Botany is related to this book, The Wildflowers of New England. It's, it's the same organization that has put both of those things together. Great. Excellent, thanks, Liz. Um, and so, of the buckwheat family flowers you mentioned, the genus names were different. Is that is that usual? Yeah. So, in the buckwheat family, this is one of the things that has happened with recent scientific advances in in how uh, how botanists name plants. They actually look at chemical signals, um, uh, molecular chemical signals, and um, and figure out what plants are related to each other. A lot of those plants used to be in one genus, the genus Polygonum. And polygon means, right, a polygon, hectagon, uh, hexagon, pentagon, um, many angles, and it refers to the three-angled fruit um, that is the familiar buckwheat. Um, if you've looked at buckwheat growths, that's what it is, a three, three-angled thing. But so many of the members of that group were in the genus um, polygonum, and that genus has now been split into several different genera. So there were some that are called Persicaria, and those are the smart weeds, and then Fallopia, uh, which is that climbing buckwheat is in the genus Fallopia, and that also includes uh, Japanese knotweed. So th that, those are changes from, for example, in Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, you'll find them all in the same genus and now they are separated. Same with the asters. Sorry about that. I, <laughs> they used to all be aster, but now there's several different genera of aster. This keeps everybody on their toes. Keeps us on our toes. <laughs> um, great. 
Okay, uh, let's see. So Jackie lives near a farm field. It used to grow corn and soybeans on alternate, on alternate years. Which of these native plants could I plant to increase biodiversity in my yard that won't be disruptive to my neighbor's farm fields? You know, um, there is, uh, of the plants that we've looked at, to, to particularly the, uh, all those asters and goldenrods and joe pie and, and bone set, those are things that'll do well in a field and will not bother, um, will not become invasive in a neighbor's uh, farm field. Um, I wouldn't worry about that. We, if weeds are going to get to where they want to go, regardless of what you do. Um, so, uh, the, and the weeds that will invade a farm field, some things that, like there's this sedge called nut sedge that invades farm fields that is, um, you know, it's just, it, it flies on the wind. Those things are just going to get to where they want to be. So I wouldn't wor actually worry about that. Another thing I would say is, um, you don't need to plant much. You can just let things go. And, and ultimately, unless you've got reed canary grass that really, or, or something else very invasive, for the most part, if you just let your field go, um, these goldenrods, joe pie weed, asters will come in on their own very quickly. That's great. And, and I just wonder, Liz, you know, Shannon had a question just about milkweed, and it sounds like Shannon's noticed a decrease in milkweed. Um, she has 10 acres and only had three plants. Her friend had 15 acres and we could not find any. Do you know anything about the, any sort of milkweed numbers or issues there? Or could it be reed canary grass or what? It, yeah, it could be something crowding it out. Um, yeah, it could be something crowding it out. I, I don't know of anything general that trends, general trends that I've heard, um, except that, excepting related to management. You know, if you mow too soon uh, or mow too often, you're going to lose your milkweeds. But it sounds like it's not that, that it's just some some other mysterious um, cause. And it, it might be something invasive like reed canary grass that's crowding it out. Hard to say without looking at the specific site. Great. Thanks, Liz. And then Lynn was just... Um, She's saying, you know, she was wondering, can milkweeds be successfully planted or any other comments you might have about milkweeds? Yeah, milkweed can be successfully planted. It's also, um, okay, guys, I, I had like a million slides I wanted to show you and I had to really pare them down. One of them was my front garden, which I let go this year. I just let it go. And it's just full of all these things that are just wonderful, including milkweed. I mean, it came in on its own. It just came in on its own. And um, I'm so happy. And I have, you know, I have monarchs and I have all kinds of stuff. And, and thankfully, nobody in my family says, what's wrong with you? Why don't you eat your garden? Um, but um, so it, it does really come in on its own. Um, but yeah, you can plant it as well. Well, so just to follow up to that, Emily is wondering, sort of you mentioned planting New England Astro in your garden, and is it easy to plant or seed wildflowers in your garden? Sounds like they just kind of come in on their own. Do you clear space or toss seeds in with other vegetation? Is there a strategy? Yeah, so in this that? case, my strategy, actually, I bought plants um, of, of an organization in my town, which is the town of Jericho, which is working very hard. Uh, there are members of the town in Jericho working very hard to get people to plant wildflowers. And they have wildflowers planted in the green strip on the main road of town, for example. It's just beautiful. Again, a slide I would love to have shown you, but um, just drive through Jericho Center and you'll see it. It's, it's quite amazing. And, um, but anyway, they, they had last year, they had a, a sale um, of, of some of these native plants and just a little tiny slip. It was just, you know, hardly any roots at all. Uh, but but they, they were selling plants from a nursery, and that's what I did. I, I bought those plants. But as I said, my gardening friend says that her clients find New England Aster coming up just on its own in their gardens, and they want her to get rid of it. Um, so, again, it will come up on its own in your garden. Great. Um, and, and I guess this is, there's, you know, a couple of questions of folks wondering, you know, one one person had seen, hadn't seen, um, hadn't seen cardinal flower and now finds it's making a mini comeback and, and another sort of more general question just about how is climate change affecting wildflowers? Liz, I don't know if you make any comments about, you know, 
can climate change, will that work to an advantage or what species might be at more risk? Um, Yeah, I mean, the biggest problem with climate change really is the timing of the relationships between insects and plants. Um, And that that comes into play in the spring in particular, um, when the movement of of insects and the emergence of the plants emerging earlier than the insects actually arrive. Um, that is, is really a problem that some people are just beginning to study, and it's not, there's not a lot of documentation of, of that yet. Um, but that is, that's, one of the, that's one of the problems. You know, and, then, and then another, another <clears throat> thing is that some wildflowers, that, the things will change. I mean, the, the, the suite of wildflowers that grows here in our fields now um, is likely to change as the climate changes. Again, um, you know, this is, these are things that we're watching, that other scientists are watching. I would actually point to a really great book, um, I didn't list it in the resources, but a really great book by Richard Primack called Walden Warming, which is a book, um, Primack is a scientist who has studied, and he and his students have studied, gone back to Thoreau, Thoreau in, in Eastern Massachusetts, Thoreau's records of when things flowered and, um, and, and some data that they followed since that time. So for a very long time, records going back a long time, seeing how, the differences between Walt, uh, Thoreau's time, which is mid 19th century and, and our time and um, in really documenting some significant changes in flowering times um, as the climate has changed. That's, so that's a great place to start. Um, Walden Warming by Richard Primack. Excellent, thanks Liz. And I just put up a link to that in the chat for folks. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll do one more, one more question. Um, and that is, I guess maybe we'll end on, so Bonnie's wanting, there's another fen near Woodstock. I assume that's Eshqua. Um, yeah. Uh, Ashqua bog, another one that's bought a bog that's really a fen, or named a bog, but it's really a fen. Would she expect to find some of the same flowers you mentioned um, in Chickering? And then Liz, are there any other sort of similar places like that in the state that folks could visit? Um, yeah, you know, there's not a, pl- a lot of places that are, um, that are open for visitation like that. It's a rare natural community for starters. There's not a lot of fens. And those are the two that I know of that have boardwalks and that have accessibility um, to visit. So um, yeah, I don't I don't know of any other fens that are open to visitation. Um, but so Eshqua Bog in in Heartland, yeah, it's it's a beautiful site that is if if the person is familiar with it, they know very well that that's where you go to see showy lady slippers in late June. It's just just a abundant showy lady slippers. But yeah, many of the other things that grow in Chickering Fen will grow in Eshqua Bog as well. Although Eshqua Bog is not as open as Chickering Bog is, it's a little bit more um, shrubby and, and closed in, but um, so it's, it's slightly different, but some of the same things will grow there as well. Great, Liz. And Tom, I see, is, is sort of chiming in about Pownal Bog. He said he used to go there when he was at college at Williams. Is that a, another? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and I actually don't know. Maybe Tom knows, but I don't actually know whether um, Pownal Bog, um, which I have visited, but whether it is got a boardwalk or is, is one that people can visit. Frankly, I don't know. Great. Well, if folks are interested in visiting some of these places, if you go to the Nature Conservancy Vermont's website, you'll find a list of their natural areas, including Eshqua and Chickering to go visit. And then the Vermont Land Trust also has a recreation map where uh, some of our natural areas are also listed. Yeah. Um, and there's another, yeah. there's another um, in the book, Wetland, Woodland, Wildland, which is the guide to natural communities of Vermont. For each natural community, there are places to visit in that book as well. Perfect. Great. Excellent. Well, thanks, Liz. I guess any other comments before we um, say goodnight to everyone? I would say um, go out there and look for stuff. It's just so fun, so rewarding. I've had a blast doing it these last few weeks, and uh, I'm going to keep doing it, so I hope you will, too. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, Caitlin, for hosting, and um, 
Thank you. Great. All right. Thanks, Liz. Wonderful presentation. Thanks, everyone.